My name is Heike Bunte. I'm from the free and Hanseatic city of Hamburg in the borough of Altona. And now I'm really proud to present the Lucia project and nighttime cycling and cycling during dark hours. Apart from that, night time cycling or cycling during dark hours is very important and we proud we are really proud that we can present a whole session and can contribute with the whole session to this important issue i'm very proud that especially with the northern countries and the baltic sea region we can contribute with a high value on this issue because winter time or dark hours has a completely different meaning over there. So in the next 60 minutes, you will get a deep insight what it means. And I'm also very proud to get contribution and moderate as a moderator. Manfred Neun, as you know him very well as a former ECF president as well. So we will guide you through this session. Manfred, the floor is yours now. Thanks. Thank you very much, Heike, for giving me, me the floor. Welcome also from, from my side as a co-moderator. And I just like to continue what Heike started with, the rich diversity of nighttime cycling. On the one hand, it's a real, real challenge, but on the other, side it delivers all what we need for cycling for integrated and sustainable mobility in a nutshell this first picture of one of the four presentation gives you roughly an idea and when you compare this with all the elements with all the subsystems of cycling and of integrated mobility then you can really already get a first idea that all is in. This six dimension you can see here are called building blocks and they are from the fusion mobility approach. This is just to give you a short preview how we afterwards will wrap up all the four presentations, analyze it, so be curious. And this gives you now uh, the overview, which four presentations will now follow in the follow-up. These four titles then will be introduced to you again by Heike. Enjoy. Please, Mark, start your presentation. And we are proud that you also will introduce the Bicycle City After Dark. Thanks. Thank you very much for this uh, introduction. So, as you said, I'm Mark Burton Page. I'm uh, the director of Lucy. Lucy is the international network of cities focusing on urban lighting. And when we think about tomorrow's cities, and we think concretely how to improve uh, the lives of people who live in cities, and that is, by the way, more than half of the world's population. One of the things that's really always fascinated me is the nighttime. Because the night is actually 50% of our time, of the world's time. And until now, night has always been the invisible facet of cities, where things are not seen. Things are different. When um, we might feel disoriented in the city. We might feel unsafe. And cities have mainly been designed um, from a daytime perspective. However, in the past decades, the 24-hour city has really emerged. And we need to think, what actually happens after dark in the city? What are the different uses of the city at night? And of course, in the city at night, you may have the city of leisure and culture. You may have the festive city, people going to clubs, to bars, open street partying, etc. But also you have the city of the deep night, where uh, most people are asleep and only the core vital functions of the city are still awake. 
think of the city of the night watch with safety and security um, medical people the city of the night shift factory workers or cleaners and people in these layers of the city really need our consideration too and frankly <laughs> Some people really need our admiration, too, in the middle of the night, slicking under the snow. But things have started to change in terms of public policy. And we see new dimensions of the city at night. We see, um, for example, um, a political dimension with this night czar, nightmares. Here you have Ami Lame from London. And there are many um, various nightmares or nighttime advocacy organizations that are really starting to think about how to govern the nighttime as a new form of urban governance. Um, there are more publications. This is one from, from us, from Lucy, but there are many more. There are more research organisms that are thinking about nighttime night studies. And we also need, of course, new design paradigms, new legislation, etc. And a lot of things are happening at the moment on these questions. And what are the challenges of the city at night? Well, I would say a lot of those challenges are similar to the ones of the city by day. And some are quite specific to the night. The competing use of the urban realm of the city, um, you know, between people who wish to sleep, people who wish to work and play. And there's also a kind of a competition, not only about us humans, but also a lot of flora and fauna are active at night. So this really needs to be factored in our global reflections. And of course, this really translates into lighting challenges. You know, how do we light a city for these multiplicity of uses uh, for safety, for beauty, for efficiency, mobility, and we have to find the right balance. And if we concentrate on how we move in a city, the mobility part, although we've seen more and more cities opening uh, 24 hour public transport, and that's really, really good. It's also fair to say that the streets of our cities, uh, day or night, are really still designed around the use of cars. And we've seen, I think, with um, the COVID pandemic, uh, that now how a lot of the, the PMDs, the professional mobility devices, and especially bicycles, have become more and more important, but also um, in link with other, uh, other modalities of, of personal mobility. And during the phase of the COVID lockdowns and the curfews, We've seen major disruptions on how people move around a city. Um, and on, in some places, there were pop-up bike lanes that really, you know, uh, because there were so many cyclists, et cetera. A question that has been raised is, as we upgrade this walking and uh, cycling infrastructure in the city, how do the other infrastructure go with it? How do we upgrade? How do we respond with public lighting also to such a situation? And here, I'm specifically thinking about the um, yeah, the heights or the distance of the poles, you might think. Um, their upgrade capacity in terms of uh, presence detection or uh, brightness level and interaction levels. Here you see principles of interactive pedestrian lighting, and I'd like to see you know, these principles for interactive cycling uh, lighting, perhaps. But also, there are plenty of other light sources outside the, the streets, uh, lighting infrastructure, you see here luminescent markings, of course, uh, luminescent street coatings uh, are interesting. There are also lights that are emitted from private buildings, and I wouldn't, but I wouldn't want to be there. Um, they are also often less controlled and even more glary. And how do we, as a public authority, as a city, how do we adapt these? Um, there's also a lot of more personal lighting equipment. Uh, light, uh, cyclists, it seems, are better, better equipped uh, on lighting. So um, there's, you know, miniature, more powerful flashing, with various colors, etc. Um, and also the light wearables. I think that's interesting to factor in. And perhaps leads us to this question. Are we going to need public lighting for cycling at all in a city? Now, the answer is probably yes, because uh, we want to avoid that. Um, that's, that's the main reason for safety. But what is really new is in cities today, with the, the, the evolutions, I think, of public lighting, um, the lighting can re really be adapted to where and when it's needed. 
And it's really important that we factor in a lot of the data, a lot of the data science that comes in with the, the smart city also. Um, we better define what we need um, for these policies and for cyclists and other users together. Here you see the data of the Vélib rides in Paris um, throughout the night. They also are um, uh, really important. So it's useful, we better define, we better see the data, we better analyze it. Um, and this is where the smart and interactive lighting comes in and there's a presentation uh, a bit later about these questions. We also need to take, uh, to continue raising the awareness around the need of lighting, of course, but the need of darkness and this balance between these two needs, the light and the dark, and especially how we tackle light pollution, which is a very important topic. Showing what light can do, of course, its potential in listening to the needs uh, of what uh, uh, might be done. Also doing night visits. And, you know, I think one of the, the ways we could do that is have special uh, cycling tours um, where the uh, experience of the users could really be sought for and factored. And we'd love to do that in Lisbon uh, with you all, but uh, unfortunately we can't, perhaps next time. When we started this discussion about the bicycle city uh, at night, I saw a lot of eyes opening and a lot of ears. This is really somewhat new, um, a new avenue of discussion and exchange, and I hope we can all contribute to that from our position, a new avenue for research, for uh, designers, for the industry, for public policies, of course. And this is why we really call also the cycle uh, community um, to work with cities, uh, to integrate the, the nighttime design inside the uh, cycle agendas and uh, all the questions around that. And we at Lucy, we're really um, happy to, to help work a lot of cities on this very important topic. And I think together um, we can really improve the, the lighting of our cities and our cities after dark and really help the quality of life of a lot of people. Thank you very much for your attention. Mark, thanks a lot for that really uh, very good presentation and the insight from a real expert. Let's continue now with our uh, four presenters. And um, they already contributed a lot also to the Lucia uh, project. Topi Hapanen from Finland, Borvo, um, was responsible for economic aspects of public lighting. I'm happy that we can welcome him uh, today here as well. And Topi focuses on dark time cycling, because as I mentioned it before, winter or dark hours, it's a completely different story in Northern Europe. Toppy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Heike. And now I'm going right to my topic. I think now you can see my presentation. Yes, uh, it's great to uh, great honor to be here in in front of this audience. You are the really experts of of uh, cycle, cycling world, and and I'm very humble to be here. And like in our Lucia projects, I've also learned lots of city lightning as such. And now I'm able here uh, able to be here in front of you with with talking about cycling. And uh, my topic is dark time cycling, the northern perspective. And what what I'm going to go through is First, some backgrounds and reflections from Lucia project, then dark time cycling in the north, these circumstances where I come from, and then uh, quickly some main challenges and some observations also, and try to, at the end of end of the presentation, try to answer why to develop all this, where are we, where are we really going? So let's get into the business and my first question is for myself, am I an average Finnish cyclist? I'm asking this because uh, uh, I would say that I am an average uh, semi-lazy middle-aged man from Finland who has bike, who has also car and who lives in a small city and uses bike for, for many occasions during the day, but also using car. And uh, uh, 
I'm not such a cycling enthusiast like many of you are, but I think if men like me will shift their attitude or 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 way of behaving such that they will really appreciate cycling more, then people like me can do the change to make cycling more. But let's see how it goes here in here in Finland. First of all, I would like to give this one slide the reflection from Lucia project. This is our Lucia pilot site in Porvo, Finland. I would like to talk to you uh, many hours of about all the technology, all the issues behind this, but the, just to give you a quick look that I, you can see that the cycling is very important part of our pilot site and we have uh, tried to find the suitable and best solutions from modern technology to help these cycling conditions. But this is the overview about pilot site will be ready end of this month and whenever coming to Finland please come to Porvo and check this out. But then about this duck time cycling in the north. My main message is here that uh, in Finland, like other northern countries, winter season can be seen as equal to dark time. Like Mark said, it's 50% per of the day is dark time. And if you ask that from Finnish person during the winter time, he will uh, definitely say that it's 100%. But it's totally other way around at, at the summertime. But the winter time is dark. And besides that, there are very uh, challenging weather conditions. But interesting part is that this uh, unfortunate climate change has changed our winters. Those winters has become more warmer. This means that we do not have not so much ice or, or snow. And this all also opens totally different view when talking about this cycling world. Then uh, uh, in this slide, I would only say that this long dark hours, they start really early in the winter time. I mean, 4 p.m. and then continuing almost to 9 a.m. or even even longer, depending on what time, what place in the Finland you are. But the meaning is that those hours are exactly on those uh, commuter traffic hours. And then again, thinking about cycling and how to increase cycling. This is something you have to really take account. Uh, so uh, in basically there is in Finland, in northern countries and everywhere, it's strong need to achieve an impact for more climate friendly cities, of course. And we can see really that the cycling is one uh, key to that look. Uh, cycling are year around. And, uh, but you, so you can see that there are, let's say, critical attitude towards it because of the conditions. So the weather conditions are so challenging at the, at the winter time. So that's that's something we really have to go over and and adopt it. And now I will give you uh, quickly some observations. Uh, a bike tour last week. I won't mention the place where I was <laughs> biking because that that's not the not the key, but uh, three pictures. This is the basic. You have good lights in your bike, you ride and uh, everything is okay. But when someone comes to watch you, then you know, is it uh, powerful lights from bike or car, whatever. This, the second picture, this is everything's good. You have good lights and you know where it's going. But if you look at this picture from here, this is very steep hill and there is a road and there are no lighting on this path. So on the road, when you're going go by walk or by bicycle or by car, you do not know that there are paths and there are people coming quite fast. But the most interesting picture is this. Again, you are driving here, you see this intersection, there is a road and, but what you do not see is that this path you are riding continues after this road. So this is uh, important because during daylight, this road, which goes uh, forward here is very commonly used and, and in everyday use, but on the dark hours, it's that, it, it, it isn't that. So uh, this uh, 
slide from Finnish Road Safety Council is only because that private uh, property owners have also their part in lighting, but also for this so-called sanding in, in, in northern countries uh, to make it icy surfaces much more safer. So I just wanted to highlight that it, that's not only about the public authorities who take care of this, but the private property owners have their own obligations too. Uh, then uh, the question, where are we going? Why to develop all this? Like, as, like we know, there is a huge potential to increase cycling in the north. But on my opinion, that needs a sharp strategy and much more important, co-creational planning together with different user groups. Uh, here is, if you remember something from my speech, I think this is the key takeaway, which I would like to raise, is that we really need a master lighting plan for cycling conditions, but these have to go hand by hand. There is no, these cycling conditions are not like a satellite. It's, it's, it's the core of this kind of sustainable urban mobility plan. But now when we look about the lightning, then it's very important to take both of these sides, both, both of these sides along with us. And uh, this is pretty much the facts you already know, the target groups, more cycling commuters, less tra car traffic, less traffic jams, less CO2 emissions. Employers, there are new ways to increase the well-being of the employees and also incentives. But these families, this is, uh, at least here in Finland, we have uh, families normally have two cars if they do not live in the city center. Like many of the families do, they, they live a, a bit away from the center, so they need two cars. But if we can uh, create these cycling conditions so well that those families could divest the second car, then we could achieve some tangible, tangible uh, results for, for this development. And then against students and youngsters, they are already now using lots of bicycles, so that's, that's a very clear target group which really can do the different in the future. And uh, about, uh, this is my last slide, about thinking Lucia project what other way around, meaning that uh, let's focus uh, strictly to the impacts and this increases demand of implementing small smart lightning. I would, I'd like to say that the hand, handprint of this impacts is, is important. Of course, we can think about the technology, do implementations, but I would like to see the viewpoint to the impacts. And for doing this, we need that uh, overall master lightning plan where the cycling conditions are uh, in it. So uh, I would say at, at, at last that the impact evaluation of the overall urban mobility, mobility development is, is it, it will give more active residents, better accessibility, more private sector involvement also, and more economical benefits with private and public cooperation, and of course, less CO2 emissions. Uh, I think this was what I was trying to tell you. I hope you got something from this. This is my equipment, old bicycle, nothing fancy about it and the warehouse's background from Borvo. So thank you for this moment. Now we stay in the north. We go now to Sweden, to Gothenburg, and here to Michelle. Michelle is working for the city administration, city council, and they did a really lovely project. Michelle, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you, Heike, um, and it's great to be here. And Topi, yes, we do appreciate the um, difficulties and challenges of nighttime cycling, even here in Gothenburg in Sweden. Um, thank you. As Heike mentioned, I'm representing the city of Gothenburg, the Urban Transport Administration. Um, today, I'm going to show you um, a presentation regarding the infrastructure and tunnels. One moment, please. Okay, 
in my presentation, um, I hope you can see. Uh, creating infrastructure tunnels for Gothenburg's people, a subjective and objective safety and planning. In 2013, the city of Gothenburg started a program called the Safe and Beautiful City. And as part of this program, a project called Light Art was established. Although since 2013, the actual um, corporation started earlier with the Lucy Association that Mark has previously told you about, where the seed was uh, sown for this wonderful project. The objective of this project uh, was to find out how light and art combined uh, could be used in tunnels and other unsafe places to increase a sense of safety and well-being amongst the citizens, especially in the darker hours, which can be any time between um, 4 p.m. to 9 a.m., as Toppy indicated. Um, the city, we believe that it is the democratic right of every individual and every um, city in the community to be able to move safely uh, in and around the city, including in the darker hours which is also a challenge of a city. Uh, during the project, a new method that combined light and iron tunnels is used involving the different groups in the communities. So a co-creation between the city. So many different city administrations were involved. Uh, the, the traffic department where I'm from, as well as the culture department, for example, politicians at both uh, local and regional level, the industry, and also the citizens of the community. Uh, this was probably the most uh, important aspect in involving the citizens of the people who live in these communities. So they felt that their voices were heard. And when your voice is heard, then you feel part of it. And then you're most likely to continue to feel part of it and use the infrastructure that the city provides. Since the project started in 2013, nine tunnels have been renovated. And these nine tunnels are very important um, connections between the different parts of, of the city. So the result was a profound concept of light art in tunnels, which displays an approach when working with light and art in tunnels. But here I also want to highlight the, um, the aspects, the softer measures, and how we must appreciate these results. Um, how the, the, this, as I mentioned, that the citizens feel and still feel part of the project and that they are included in the process and that they belong to the community and they actually cared about. And we also have seen how perhaps um, in more not non desirable aspects of the community is being involved in, in, in using these tunnels um, to create and help create a more a safe place for all citizens. Um, so now I'd like to show you an example of uh, a tunnel. It's called the Time Tunnel. And the reason why this was called the Time Tunnel is because people using this tunnel to cycle and to, to walk through could actually feel conscious of the time it took to get from one end to the other. And you, you'll see more about this in the film that I will, I will show you. So now I'm going to attempt to share, um, share this video. So one moment, please. Och Frölunda, den är väldigt lång, väldigt djup och väldigt svår att hantera belysningsmässigt. Jag tror den är 70 meter lång och 70 meter tunnel som, som inte är genomtänkt för att vara öppen och med siktlinjer och ta hand om den här känslan av, av trygghet och otrygghet. Då trosar vi ihop en, en konstnär och en ljusdesigner. Och sen får de ett uppdrag att ta hand om en tunnel. Ljus och konst tillsammans skapar ju den här möjligheten att mötas på grund av att det verkligen talar till våra sinnen. Jag tror ju att bildkonst, eller bildkonstens syfte på något sätt, är att kommunicera med det andra än rösten, om man säger så. Aspekten av medborgarrösten är superviktig. Och ju mer man upplever att man blir hörd, desto större är chansen att man känner sig som en del av 
av något större. Jag har varit tinnerädd i hela mitt liv, alltså i 14 år. Det känns bra att leva här för man känner alla och man känner sig väldigt trygg. Jag brukar inte använda den så mycket, men ibland när jag missar bussen så brukar jag då ta den tunneln och gå förbi. Just nu i tunneln så är det väldigt otryggt, läskigt. Man känner sig inte så säker. Största utmaningen i en stad med belysning det är nog att få det att bli det här medlet för att känna sig trygg och säker. Att ha ljus på kvällen och natten när det är mörkt det är ju att ha frihet att röra sig. I Göteborg idag kan vi inte styra 100 procent av belysningen. Vi är väl uppe kanske 20-30 procent av beståndet. Där vi kan de facto höja och sänka precis som vi vill. Ljus är en demokratisk rättighet tycker jag. Gator och torg i en stad det är ju vårt gemensamma. Och om man inte vågar vara ute för att man känner sig otrygg. Då är det ju inte riktigt demokrati. Okej okay, Michel, thank you so much that you highlighted your video and this aspect of subjective and objective uh, safety. And I'm really happy that you also highlighted diversity mm. in terms of human beings in public spaces. And I'm also very happy that you touched the socioeconomic aspects as well because public lighting must be for everybody. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, the example of the time tunnel <laughs> was really good. And thanks a lot for that. Mm, you're welcome. And welcome to Gothenburg. Yes, <laughs> in the tunnel, in the time tunnel. In the tunnel, we can take you through. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Now our next presenter will be Rianne Falkenberg from the Netherlands, Eindhoven Technical University. My name is Rianne Valkenburg from Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands. And I want to take you on a journey to the future of urban lighting and what it can mean for the use of public space and especially cycling in there. But what is smart urban lighting? Ever since the introduction of LED, the digi digitalization of lighting systems has started. And this digitalization provides endless opportunities because we can steer every light pole by itself. We can provide the right light at the right moment in the right place and with the right atmosphere. So we can really locally adjust everything. And in that way, people are enabled to use and enjoy public space better than they are now. And that can all be done in an energy efficient way. But if anything is possible, then we really need to understand what we really want. So in the Interreg Smart Space project, we have eight pilot sites that we investigated in four cities. And together with citizens and local stakeholders like shop owners or companies or the police or whatever is, is suited for that area, we identified what their needs and opportunities were. And of course, this is very local and very specific, but we still wanted to see if we could find some structure or logic behind that. So by analyzing all these uh, lighting scenarios, we came to five interaction levels in what way smart lighting can be used in interaction with what people want. I will go through these five levels one by one and giving examples for how they can be used for road safety. The first level uh, of interaction is static lighting. Here the lights do not adapt to activities yet, so it's more or less like old fashioned lighting. We can put them on or off. But to make sure that 
And the, the scenes are predefined and controlled for one point. So we looked into safe commuting at the station square in Ostend, where there's lots of people arriving and going by different means. There's a tram, there's buses, there are bicycles, of course, there's a train. So what can you do with the lighting scenes? You have to provide a good overview of the area so that people can see each other. They can see each other approaching, but they can also see um, uh, uneven surfaces so that it's safer for them to, to walk or to cycle there and that collisions and accidents are avoided. But in this level, there's no interactivity yet. At the second level of interaction, active lighting, multiple lighting scenes are created for specific routes, locations, times of the days and seasons. All these scenes are still predefined and they are controlled from one point. So here we looked into a scenario for safe crossings in Middelburg. Safe crossings, especially for pedestrians and cyclists. So what we did, you can see the main road on the left. What if we turn off the light there to save energy? Then the only need that people expressed is that they can still cross safely. So we used multiple lighting scenes that can still dim down during the night, but that makes sure that when there's someone that wants to cross the street, that he or she is highlighted and can be seen by the cars. At the third level of interaction, reactive lighting, the lights start adapting to multiple scenes on things we notice in the environment and characteristics that are based on real-time input. So a well-known phenomenon in cities is the loading and unloading delivery vans. And that's always done at times when there's also commuting. So in this case, there were children cycling to school in St. Niklaas. Uh, and what we did is, what if we can create brighter areas around uh, parked fans so that they can be seen and that collisions can be avoided. So it's just a temporary thing that only lights up when a fan is parked. At the fourth level of interaction, interactive lighting, the lights anticipate with local adaption and on real time input. This is an example in Tipperary where cyclists and pedestrians have to pass alongside a mixed traffic road. They feel unsure because they are not seen by cars. So what we do is we create brighter areas around them with local adaption. So the light poles identify there is someone and then create light and the light moves along with them so that they feel seen, but also that cars can actually see these people that are there. At the fifth level of interaction, intelligent lighting, the light also adapts to personalized effect, but it can also, it's also based on a self-learning system. So to increase safety and comfort for road users, the system can learn also from historical data. So it knows in certain weather conditions, for instance, that there are more accidents and then it can adjust its own lighting scenes without people interfering in that. We have no picture there yet because we could hardly imagine it, but we can imagine that it will go there in future. Because smart lighting systems consist of different technical components. Of course, there's the lighting itself, but smartness also requires controls, which are sensors and software. Of course, there's data gathered and that data should be managed. And there's the basic infrastructure. These components differ and to become a, a smart system, they also have to be integrated and they have to uh, communicate with each other. And it has to be designed as one system. So you need to understand what technology uh, is needed where. And that's why we created a technology roadmap. Now that goes way beyond this introduction because the main takeaway for today is that smart lighting provides many opportunities to improve the use of public space. 
And it is something that's already happening and it will further develop in near future. So to create value with it, especially for people in that public space, you need to understand what this will mean for your public space. And you need to involve citizens and other local stakeholders in defining those needs and opportunities because it's about their neighborhoods and it's about their behavior that you want to support. The five levels of interactive use with smart lighting will then define different lighting solutions and will support you to make future-proof decisions for investments of these systems. Thank you very much. And if you want to know more, a booklet with further information and with much more examples in how to use smart lighting is free downloadable from our website. Thank you very much. I'm very happy uh, to introduce my colleague Mariana Schröter, also from the Free and Hanseatic City of Hamburg. The best light we can provide is wonderful, but if it comes to vandalism, especially in city, we have a vicious circle and a serious problem again. Mariana will show a tiny little aspect of vandalism and how we maybe can deal with it or cities in the future. Mariana, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you, Heike, um, for having me today. I am Mariana and I work with the, G uh, the GIS department here um, together in the city of Hamburg. And I'm here today to talk about monitoring vandalism. But it's quite simple, right? When it comes to vandalizing our lamps or traffic signs or even our pets, as you see in the first picture of our pilot site panel, we see a practical connection to the topic. Um, simply put, we have a pragmatic approach. We ask ourselves, where are our lamps vandalized? Are they broken? Is there um, lightning missing to our pedestrians and cyclists in the city? We are looking at policy and law enforcement. And we are also looking at my favorite topic as a GIS um, expert, is how we monitor and access and analyze it to understand the patterns and help us achieve an efficient management of the public space. There, <laughs> there we wanted to do the survey um, on acts of vandalism in our pilot site luminaires illustrated on this map. Now, we did collect the data less than one year after the replacement, and we use a mobile GIS app. Um, which we customize for faster, efficient collection and a quicker analysis. Um, the criteria were um, quite simple. We looked at presence of stickers, graffiti, um, if the lampposts were banned, defective, if there were um, damage to the glasses and so on. And the results for this uh, sample survey was a little bit shocking, but not that shocking because only 10% um, of the lamps evaluated did not present um, signs of vandalism, as we call a few stickers on it or um, a little bit of graffiti. But at the end, we didn't have any serious signs of um, vandalism, but one lamp glass that was um, damaged. Um, we have a total of 120,000 public luminaires in Hamburg, and our statistics shows that around 3% of them were vandalized in the last six, um, seven years, um, with, with a median of 500 um, cases per year, um, which we cannot compare because different methodologies, and um, we just look and little more details um, for the stickers, for example. We have uh, listened now to many aspects of dark hour cycling, nighttime cycling, and uh, I think it is good that we put it now in a nutshell. Manfred will now foster on active mobility and fusion mobility and how we can combine it with public lighting. Manfred, please. 
Thank you, Heike. Nighttime delivers all in a nutshell. Please let's recall this uh, nice uh, picture of uh, Rihanna's presentation and the structure I give you as a preview. What are we talking about here? We are talking about the, on the one hand, extremely complex system of mobilities. But on the other hand, this is a huge challenge and opportunity in one. And in nighttime cycling, we can discover all these uh, elements and opportunities of integrated and systemic mobilities. First of all, these six building blocks are representing all the subsystems that are relevant. I will show you then uh, when uh, doing a short evaluation on the four presentations on before how this works in practice. Secondly, all these subsystems are not isolated. It's not enough if you have just a list with all of them. They are all interacting one by one and in a triangle and so forth. The third issue is sometimes we realize in cities, in planning, in budgeting, the huge competition between the several subsystems. But what we need is that they will work without any frictions, that they will collaborate, that they will unleash the higher potential in interactions. Number four is, and this we have already seen in many of these or in all of the presentations, people are coming first and safety plays a really important role. Additionally, in times of digitalization, mobilities are unleashing their higher potential, in particular active modes, in particular cycling, when we use all the new smart options for better connected mobilities. So, looking to the structure of the four building blocks and taking the great example of the first presentation. Topi, thank you so much for this cornucopia you, you opened. It's great to see in the fast overview you gave us what's your normal which is not the normal, this long lasting dark, you are challenging, but you are really making the best of it. I guess people in other parts of the world can really not imagine how different this is. All your investments, as we can see here in infrastructure, it's really a development of public space. This uh, green Excel is extremely strong in what you told to us but also how you are fostering cycling, the active mode with a master lighting plane using infrastructure options. Uh, also the connected, the smart part with smart lighting. This all is based on what you addressed with your master lighting plane, giving people a better access, unleashing benefits in particular here in the sustainable field and for safety overall. Thanks a lot for this. In the second presentation by Michelle, we saw an art project. So somebody may think, hey, what's about that? Art, what can this help in night times? But it was not only your video clip that, that gives us a great insight. It's also when you are going through all the six dimensions here, you will see all plays a really strong and valuable role in this. It is about, as you said, it's, <laughs> I do not like that you said the soft measures. This is the common saying, but it are hard facts when we are talking about who people feel because this is exactly what's good in active mobility, in particular in cycling, that it's an asset to develop uh, the democratic rights of all people and do not have the imbalance to unleash the freedom of cycling. Thanks a lot for that. In the third presentation, then we were entering the value of smart urban lighting. 
And this makes, of course, strong the connected mobility part. It makes also very, very strong, again, public space and infrastructure. It's a, a demonstration of very, very modern and stimulating new technology. And again, it's a huge benefit for active mobility and to unleash the sustainability factors. In my opinion, there are many, many good options here as well that are already not unleashed. So I'm very, very curious how this development will get fostered and be continued. And finally, in the fourth presentation, uh, we again saw how diverse night cycling as a field of research and development is to see from a worst case exception to a new and better normal or in other words again from a challenge to a chance and to create new opportunity broken lights seem to be a pilot but i guess it's a great a great beginning and here you can see already if you now look to the structure that i presented to you this active mobility uh, focusing structure of fusion mobility then it's not only a help to evaluate and see what's already done what's already good what's in a great development it's also a kind of creativity tool to unleash new options and give you ideas how you can continue that means all the factors i drafted to you in the beginning will come into force but most important and this is my last thought it's about cycling diversity that we are able to shake, showcase and to unleash, in particular, in nighttime cycling. So let's start with this into the panel discussion right now. I guess we have a lot of stuff for exchange and to share with the audience of Velocity 2021. Thank you so much for all your presentations. Thank you, Manfred. With that background, we can really start uh, to invite all the presenters and, of course, the, our keynote speaker, Mark Burton Page, please on stage now on the virtual digital stage. And um, I would like to ask you basically two questions. And maybe, Mark, you as an overall, so to say, sub viewer not only from the Lucy perspective, but you are, were also or you are still also integrated in the Lucia project during the past three um, years. What is the most stimulating or encouraging issue for you about the Lucia project? Yeah, <clears throat> well, listen. You know, I think um, for Lucy, we've been working closely with all the partners in this project. It was uh, a real pleasure to, to work with all of you. There's still a, a great um, final conference coming up. So you can, uh, you can hear about that uh, if you go on the Lucia website. One of the things we did was to especially work with Gothenburg uh, as one of the partners to deliver something we really believe in is, is exchange of knowledge. Um, and we took also the, uh, um, the advantage of this uh, pandemic, but it really reinforced this online sharing. And um, I was really proud to see that now we have around 60 experts that have um, actually um, uh, made the, 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 the step to ask uh, um, us uh, in the Lucia project to be part of this, uh, this exchange platform. So basically what it means is that uh, you go on the Lucia project website and you can ask for um, for, for yourself to be registered and you have access to this platform where you can share, you can learn, uh, you can you can interact online. And it's really a knowledge center uh, for the project, but um, also about lighting and about uh, the impacts of light and about how light can improve uh, cities. And this topic of cycle cycling at night has always also shown up a few times in our uh, discussions and uh, in the content that has been shared. So I guess um, from this project, I really uh, 
you know, take the, this fantastic cooperation that's been going on. And uh, it's really such very important topics. So let's continue this together. Um, and it's still a lot of things uh, happening uh, in the, inside the Lucia project and in the Lucy network. Sounds Thanks. great. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Let's continue with, uh, our first presentation with, with uh, Toby. I realized in your presentation, Toby, that the social dimension is incredibly strong in what you are doing. In particular, you are addressing so many diverse target groups. But from your point of view, what's your most stimulating and encouraging issue in your part of the project? Yes, thank you, Manfred. Um, that's a good question. And of course, I have to first answer it from my part of the Lucia project when we're really gathering those economic aspects of, of what what is uh, combined with this uh, smart city lighting. We learned a lot and hopefully we could del del deliver the learnings from from big audience also there are lots of things much much more than only energy savings there are there are uh how to governance models how to how to run this uh, city lighting issues inside the city or with with energy company etc and of course the second part is the pilot work and uh, for example in porvo it's it's huge significance for this pilot site because it's right in the city center and that location is is used by so many inhabitants residents daily and it will be very important place and and therefore it's also happens so that we really want to hear the people hear what they are saying, what kind of expectation they have concerning the pilot site area. And we we heard them and try to implement those wishes and viewpoints as good as possible. And even though the piloting itself is getting ready just at the last curve of our project, we will ask those questions again even after the project, but we are really interested to hear how the people in Porvo really feels about this this pilot site, because I can see that this pilot site is a more or less a key for the future development also. If we manage to do right things here, then it's much more easier to continue with the other locations too. Well, now about uh, the contribution of, um, of Rianne. It's a real pity that she cannot join us here in this panel. Nevertheless, I'd like to take the opportunity to take one uh, takeaway, uh, what I took from her presentation and which is quite important for nighttime cycling, for the diversity of cycling, but, but for the entire development of sustainable mobilities. And this is uh, in particular bridging the gap between the digital and the analog because many people are using the contributions of digitalization as a tool these are chimics you can use it it's nice fine great but digitalization is changing our entire world it's an own system and this system is an interaction with the other five systems the subsystems i have explained to you via the fusion mobility concept and in the contribution from the Netherlands by Rianne, we can see how this works and how this unleashes and is broadening the frame for mobilities overall, but in particular for nighttime cycling. So on this way and for this moment, thanks to Rianne also for this great example. Yes, indeed. And maybe Mariana, just from uh, the Hamburg perspective, this, uh, this tool was um, easy to use, uh, although he used the word, um, yeah, any idiot can use it. Um, that kind of makes me happy when it works. Um, so we can look at the bigger picture to make the city efficient um, and work better here for us and for the citizens. Okay, thanks a lot. And maybe Mark again, um, what they can learn from this session or how we can contribute or integrate cycling and walking into the 
24 hour city much better? Hmm. Well, that's, that's a huge question. And I think we will need to, you know, scratch the surface of that. Um, what I want to say to, to answer that without really answering, but, uh, uh, is really to stay together. Um, my answer to that would be for cities and mayors, you know, don't, don't stay on your own, whether you're a massive city or a very small one, don't, don't stay on your own cities uh, need to work together. Cities need partners because, um, yeah, they need to exchange with each other to dialogue, to meet and, and to learn and to make sure we don't reinvent the wheel, basically. So um, uh, we really need the power of the network to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, be at the forefront of, of this um, innovation and all, all the smart components we're talking about. This is really important to, to think about this together. And that the innovation pace uh, in the lighting uh, uh, field and I guess also in the cycling field is very, very uh, fast. So if you're together, it's, you can you can have a better chance at uh, going faster. So this is also kind of an invitation, you know, to uh, to come and work with other mayors um, and decision makers in Lucy or in other uh, networks. Alongside in Lucy, we have as as you said, 70 cities uh, that are working together, but we also have 50 uh, partners and 50 associate members that are really working together. Um, and you know, once you get people from the lighting industry. Uh, from utilities, from research, from design perspective, uh, together with the cities, usually, um, well, it goes much faster and much further uh, than if you if you stay on your own.